Hey guys, and welcome to Petrolped. Now behind me is parked the brand new BMW X1, the smallest SUV that BMW make. And I've been driving around in that car for the last week, mostly in horrible weather conditions, lots of rain and mist and just, just horrible, horrible winter weather. But luckily today, the day I want to film my review, it is a beautiful sunny day. We have much to discuss and I want to try and answer the question, is it any good? So I've just started this video by saying this is the smallest SUV that BMW make. It's still quite big. This for me feels almost as big as the X3. So this is the third generation X1. Certainly some challenging looks, I think. You're either gonna love or hate the front end of the car, but it's a really interesting platform because there's so much engine choice. There's the S-Drive 18D, which has front wheel drive, 148 bhp, the S-Drive 20i, which has 168 bhp. Then there's two X-Drive models, the X-Drive 23D with 108 bhp and 400 newton meters of torque. And then this, this is the X-Drive 23i, which has a two liter mild hybrid running 215 bhp, um, all through a seven speed dual clutch box. But that's not all. There's also a couple of plug-in hybrid variants and the iX1, which is a full battery electric vehicle. So lots and lots of choice. Confused yet? Well, I sure am. So <laughs> whichever one floats your boat, front wheel drive petrol, all wheel drive petrol, diesel, mild hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or full battery electric, the X1 has something in there for you. Let's talk about the looks. Um, I think it's quite a handsome looking car. I'm, I'm kind of bored for saying this now. I think you're either going to love or hate the front grille. It's kind of has some of the looks of its very big brother, the iX, the all battery electric big SUV that BMW make, which is a challenging car to look at, but a brilliant, brilliant car to drive. But I think the front end of this car, it's certainly purposeful. I've certainly had a lot of fun driving this car. I'll get my coat now, shall I? In terms of wheel choice, this car's running the 19 inch wheel option. These are actually an optional extra. I'll run through the spec when we jump inside the car, but you can fit this with 20 inch alloys. And I, I think for me personally, these wheels look a little bit lost on the car. They look a little bit small. I'd opt for the larger wheel size. I know that might give you a compromise in terms of ride quality, but I just think from an aesthetics point of view, much as I don't mind the wheel design on these 19 inch rims, I just think they look a little bit small. Let's wander around the back, have a look at boot space and answer the all important question. Can you fit two dogs in the boot? Now, whilst I find the front end of the car from a styling point of view, a little bit challenging, I really like the back. I'm a big fan of white cars with privacy glass. I always think that looks really cool, but these lights are very, very cool indeed. And inside here, we've got a pretty big boot, 540 liters. Is that big enough to fit two dogs though? Yes, it, of course it is. Now these guys haven't been on the channel for ages. So I thought I'd best get you on. Did you want to help with some filming? Yeah, it's a long way down. You're not jumping, but yeah, it's, it's a big old boot space. There's also a false floor here, so you can lift that up. So there's some extra storage underneath the floor. I have taken out the parcel shelf, just so that I didn't like bop them on the head when I shut the boot down. And then you can split the seats. The center part drops independently. So it's a bit like a ski hatch if you wanted to put skis in there, I guess, or you could drop either side um, in order to enlarge the amount of um, storage space you've got in here. So it's a, it's a pretty usable boot space. Do you want to get out now? Because I need to get in the back and show these guys how much room there is for the rear seat passengers. Let's let these go and play. Oh, really? Yeah. So how much space is there in the rear seat passenger compartment? Wow. One of the benefits of this car being slightly on the large side is it's got loads of space on the inside. I'm six foot three and I have a 34 inch inside leg. 
and that seat is set for me as the driver and I've still got ample room in the back. Very impressive. Lots and lots of headroom. And then this car's been spec with a panoramic roof and when the blind is pulled forward, it's quite dark and oppressive in here. As soon as that blind goes back, it's so airy and, and lightens the cabin up a huge amount. You know how much of a fan of pan roofs I am. These seats are, they're quite firm. Now there are three seats here. I'd say primarily there's two and then a, almost like an emergency seat in the middle. There are seat belts. So the, the middle passenger seat belt is actually in the roof <laughs> back over here. So you kind of pull it down and it comes across. I'm not sure how comfortable that would be on a long journey, but hey ho. But yes, loads and loads of space. Then you've got some creature comforts. You've got a couple of USB uh, sockets there for plugging in games for kids and that kind of thing. It's nice. I can imagine I could sit in here and do a long journey quite happily. Let's jump in the front and talk about that big screen. Right then. Let's do the positive stuff first. Seats, very, very comfortable. I think they look great as well. Nice driving position. My big challenge with this car is everything pretty much is done to this swooping screen there's actually two screens there's the main instrument pinnacle and then there's the center the center one with all of the various um, menus and options and the touch screen works really well the pages refresh really quickly it's all good however there are very few real buttons and i sound like a stuck record i know it's a bit cliche now to start criticizing new cars because of lack of physical buttons really good example the second day i got this car I started the car and for some reason, it was just a glitch, that main central screen didn't actually fire up. It just had a sign in the middle that just said BMW. Um, and we drove into Chichester um, and it was quite a cold day and we were cold and we couldn't actually do anything with the heating controls because everything for the heating controls is controlled through that main central screen. Um, there's a climate menu, it's super easy to get to, you push it and you can do everything in there. But if that screen's not working, I was like, wow, okay. And then, then you think there's, there's nothing else you can do either. You can't change drive modes, um, you can't answer the phone, everything is done through there. There's a main floating island kind of here, which I really, really like. Although it's quite interesting, it's kind of floating from the driver's side, but it actually has a support on the passenger side. You've got um, a, a new style kind of gear select, a little start stop button there and then this little paddle button to, to change in the gears. There's no flappy paddles on the car. There's a volume control for the stereo and that's pretty much it. One thing I don't get though is this armrest here. You can push this button and it opens but it opens the opposite way. So if you're the driver you like <laughs> have to lean over. Surely it should open that way. Oh, just a small thing. There's, there's a couple of um, uh, mode buttons on the steering wheel themselves. They take a little bit of getting used to. Um, and a couple of buttons down there um, around um, headlights and, and fog lights and so on. And, that, and that's it, really. Um, I, and I, I'm challenged by that. I, I, I think we're getting to the point now where I actually think if, an, if a car manufacturer took a step back and started making a car with physical buttons, I think it would be a real differentiator. I know the world we live in is touchscreen. Everything's got a touchscreen on it nowadays. But honestly, when you're driving along and you know, sometimes you want to do a simple operation, amazing as that, as that uh, infotainment system is and all of the options and you can program widgets and access a whole bunch of apps, you can do Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, all the things that you would expect from a modern day car. I still think some simple things are much easier, quicker, and potentially safer if they are just a physical button. I really quite like this arrangement here. You've got a, a cradle, a wireless charge cradle for your phone. It supports wireless CarPlay and Android Auto, and then a little kind of bar that just clamps your phone in place to stop it moving around. I like that. I think aesthetically it looks great. A couple of um, big drinks holders there. There's plenty of space in the door bins for drinks holders as well. And um, before we go out for a drive, let's very quickly talk about the spec of the car and pricing for this particular car. So, um, uh, as I said, this is the uh, X-Drive 23i X line. So uh, 
Base price for this car is 30, just over £38,000. It's in mineral white. That was a 600 quid option or £595 option. There are a couple of big options on here, though. It's got the Technology Plus Pack, which is £2,750. That's heated steering wheel and folding wing mirrors and adaptive LED headlights. It's a really good amount of stuff in that. So I would imagine for residuals and just for living with the car, it comes with a head-up display. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. That's probably worthwhile having. Um, this car's also got the Comfort Pack, which is basically an active seat and memory seats. That's a thousand pounds and the alloy wheels i mentioned they're an upgrade uh, the bicolor alloy wheels 695 pounds pan roof which i've been raving about that's an extra thousand quid um, and, and a few other things the the um, privacy glass 300 pounds and so on so th this press car oh the harman kardon sound system that's an extra 600 pounds but these speaker grills look fantastic and i'd always option a higher grade stereo i think that's good for residuals so so this car does have eight thousand pounds worth of options on it so suddenly instead of 38 grand this car is just shy of 46 and a half thousand pounds on the road um, which is which is a lot of money, but actually, um, for the level of kit and the amount of luxury you feel when you drive it, I, I think that's probably probably pretty good money. Let's take the car for a drive. Um, it's I say now it's not the most um, engaging drive from a kind of sporty nature, but that's not what this car is all about. So let's let's take it through a couple of the drive profiles that I guess the average owner would probably be interested in. Okay, let's <laughs> let's start this driving review with that. My first little grumble about the car, and I kind of want to get that out of the way first. So. I've got a dual clutch uh, gearbox. Uh, it's running in fully auto. There's no option to manually shift on the paddles. But one of the things that happens when you're, at, when you're stationary and you pull away, especially at T-junctions like that, quite often there's a hesitation between when you depress the throttle and when the car actually starts to move forward. And, and it, it it's probably just a fraction of a second. I haven't tried to time it because it doesn't happen every time. And that's probably the issue actually. If it happened every single time, it wouldn't be so bad, but it's an intermittent thing. But every now and again, you'll go to pull away and there'll just be this fraction of a second pause before it goes. And if you're pulling out you know, into moving traffic and you've judged a gap and there's a car coming along and it does that pause, that, that fraction of a second pause can sometimes start to make you panic a little bit and I think it's not the first car that that's happened to me in but it, it's certainly a characteristic that I'm not that keen on uh, with this auto box what I thought I'd do is just start the review in kind of urban traffic I'll drive into town um, because certainly when you're driving this car um, in a in a built-up environment the visibility is very good the, the wing mirrors are massive uh, and there's a good amount of visibility out the rear view mirror and then even things like the a pillars they're not too big there's nice visibility over the car so although it's a, a relatively big footprint car it doesn't feel that big to drive um, in terms of parking in sort of a typical car park space in a supermarket or um, you know in some kind of public space it fits in pretty well it's not as bad as one of the bigger SUVs where you really do struggle it's actually relatively easy to park super easy to maneuver it's got a whole bunch of technology that will help you park if you want to I haven't used that yet um, I'm more of a fan of parking myself if I'm honest but you know you can literally pull up to a car park space push but push a button and it and it will park the car for you now this is a mild hybrid not a hybrid and what that basically means is this car won't run on pure EV like a self-charging hybrid would. The mild hybrid system basically is there to, to help you with efficiency as much as possible. And this car, um, BMW quote, kind of early 40s miles per gallon, which I think for a car of this size in terms of petrol engine, I think it's pretty good to be fair. Honestly, I haven't had it long enough or done enough miles to really put that to the test. 
um, but the instant MPG that, that the, the car shows you on one of the screens that you can scroll through on the main dash kind of leads me to believe that that's probably the case. Certainly very high 30s MPG. Now I've got all of my heating on. I've got heated seats. I've got a heated steering wheel. Um, and you can do that. The climate menu, I know I've bemoaned the whole lack of buttons. It is relatively easy to get to. You hit that and then you've got the climate menu in front of you. And that's relatively easy to navigate. I guess, you know, with these touch screens, I think the technique is to try and do as much as you can on the touch screen when your car's stationary. And there aren't that many things you need to change mid-drive, um, but maybe heating is one of them. Now you can do the up and down temperature control just easily by pushing the button. But this car also has voice control. So if you say, hey BMW, turn the temperature up. I will increase the temperature. It will be more comfortable shortly. Let me know if it gets too warm for you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so it's just literally raised the temperature by just one degree. Hey BMW, reduce the temperature. I will reduce the temperature. It will be more comfortable shortly. Let me know if it gets too cold for you. But yeah, so I guess the more you use that um, a voice command, the car actually learns uh, your voice so it becomes more and more accurate. That is literally the first time I've tried to use that feature. And then also, I guess you'd learn what the various commands are that you'd want. It reminds me a bit about when I drove the Polestar 2 last year, I guess it was now. When I first had that car, it was all a Google dashboard and Google interface and not many buttons and I didn't like it at all. And then someone just said to me, you just need to talk to the car and get it to do stuff with your voice. And that, that's the trick for this car. So if you don't like your touch screen um, going through that to, to manage stuff, just ask the car to do it for you. Now in preparation for leaving the 30 mile an hour limit that's coming up very shortly because I know this road, I do have some drive modes in the car. And actually to go into the drive mode menu on the main screen, it's a real button. And it's a real button just down here. It just says my modes. And you go on there and I'm currently in what's called personal active. And I've got a sport and an efficiency mode. So I'm gonna just click sport and I'm gonna go into that. My display in front of me has changed a little bit. Dynamic setting for pure driving pleasure. So I'm expecting a little bit more uh, a little bit more go. I can't manually shift the gears myself. So as we come out of this 30 into a 60, and it's a particularly nice bit of 60, let's just push on a little bit and see what this car is like dynamically. Good turn of pace, good acceleration, nice smooth uh, change up a gear. The steering's got a really nice feel actually. The um, the whole car feels very solid and well put together. I've got good brakes. I do have some, some regenerative braking happening for the mild hybrid system. As I said, this isn't a self-charging hybrid. I know the internet hates that term. But for me, a, a full-blown hybrid or self-charging hybrid is a car that can run as a hybrid where an electric motor and an internal combustion engine work in tandem, or it can run as a pure EV for short periods of time. This can't do that but it does have a 48 volt system that's basically helping me um, recuperate energy and helping me be as efficient as possible. I've got a stupid pheasant, goodness me. <laughs> I just had images of arriving home with a pheasant stuck in the front grill. Just kick down there a little bit. So no, it's, it's got a, a really nice feel to it. it. It feels quite sporty and quite pacey, which is a bit of a surprise. It doesn't have too much body roll. It, it's got quite a bit of composure through the corners. I've got the X drive, four wheel drive system, so lots of stability. And actually, it's, it's trucking down this road really nicely. Really, really nicely. I think you lack the driving engagement of being able to manually shift. I can't, I can't manually shift using the, the, the shifter there. There's no paddles behind the steering wheel in this model, which I think would be a nice addition. 
um, it's always nice if you want to kind of become a little bit more involved to do that. But to be fair, the car's shifting gear quite nicely itself. It seems to be in the right gear most of the time. It's not kicking down and jumping between gears too much. So you've got a nice smooth drive, a nice good pull out of that. Just drop down a gear now and you can hear the engine revving a little bit more highly. Let's take it down one of my favourite bits of road. And here we go. So that went all the way up to a red line at around about 6,000 RPM. It's got some punch. Now I've got a few driver aids and driver assistance aids. A nice be uh, nice uh, JCW club and going the other way. Do you know what? This car's pretty good in sport mode. Let's just back off a second. I'm just gonna go again, my modes. I'm just gonna hit the efficiency button. Efficient driving setting for optimized consumption. Now I don't have a rev counter in front of me. I have an e-power meter. I've got a slightly more backed off deadened throttle. It's not as severe as some uh, efficient modes I've driven. It's still actually got quite a bit of punch. And I'm guessing, you know, if you were on a longer journey and you were conscious of trying to save a bit of money on petrol, with especially with it being so expensive nowadays, you'd stick it into that efficiency mode. What I'm not a big fan of is that screen going back to just some nice graphics there. I'd like it to drop back to the main menu rather than me having to, to do that back button again. That's better. So all in all, I'd say I think the new X1 in this uh, mild hybrid variant is an impressive car. I'd really like to drive the all-electric version. Um, hopefully I can get that sorted in the new year. It's, it's, got, it's got a lot of space to make it practical. It's, it's really comfortable from the, from the driver's cockpit. The, um, the front seats are really, really comfortable and there's loads and loads of passenger room in the back. Um, the boot space is very good, especially when you drop the seats, it makes it a super usable car. I don't know, anything from the tip run to going on holiday with loads and loads of stuff. So I like it. What do you think? I'd love to know what you think about the styling. Um, I'd like to try some of the other um, engine options. I'd, I'd quite like to try the plug-in hybrid. I'm a big plug-in hybrid fan. Um, mild hybrids are interesting one. They're, they're kind of they're a bit meh for me, they're, they're neither here nor there, but a plug-in hybrid would be very, very interesting. Anyway, let me know what you think, um, but if you've enjoyed this one, give me a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petroped for plenty more content to come, and I'll see you on the next film. You take care, guys. Drive safe.